Good morning. Or good, Hi. yeah, good morning. It's morning. It's morning. It's definitely morning. It's a Sunday. My goodness. I'm very glad that you could join me for this interview. Um, one of the things that we've done with the show a couple times is interview people, and it's mostly like I want to interview you because. Well, I always love a conversation with yeah. you, so I'm honored to be in this format. <laughs> my first time. <laughs> well, I it'll be great, um, but. Actually, why don't you meet me outside? It would be a little bit better. That's good. Okay. Yeah, I'm tired of sitting here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All, right. All right. I'll see you. It's perfect. <laughs> All right. I'm glad that I'm not the only one who leaves their turn signal on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, that is a motorcycle um, disease. All right, so this is a lot better. Not being cooped up in a stuffy office. Did I tell you so I did a 13-day motorcycle camping trip, 2,500 miles. I mean, it's a comfortable bike. And I thought I'd come home saddle sore and weary. I came home energized, like off the charts, like full of energy. I went dirt bike riding two days later. And then I get to work. <laughs> I sit down at my computer and four hours at my computer. My ass hurt, my back hurt, my neck hurt, my head hurt. It's, it, we're not meant to be at desks. We're just not. Yeah, even though you're sitting for that motorcycle trip, it's still, you're active. I mean, it's a full body, it's core, and everything's engaged on the bike. Brain, body. Okay, ready, go. Yeah, I'll follow you when it's safe. Which it is. I'm gonna try some of my track skills. Oh. I'm supposed to take it easy on these new tires, so. Tires, very important. So Elizabeth, for the viewer at home, can you introduce yourself? Like who you are, what you do? Liz Bacon, double Z's, fresh this year. Um, I am a digital product designer and manager is usually how I introduce myself these days. I have a deep background in interaction design, so that's the field I most closely identify with, but I moved into product management in 2012, thereabouts. I like to work in the domain of healthcare medical devices and that sort of stuff, because I find that um, we can do better in that arena, and uh, it's, it's a place where my heart got engaged in the work in a way that it hadn't working on you know, marketing tools and call center tech and things like that. And funnily enough, I've worked on call center tech a whole bunch and I've been doing that lately actually, but in a healthcare domain. Um, I run my own consultancy and I've gone back and forth between in-house and consulting over my almost 20 years in the field. I started at Cooper, which was a really great post-grad introduction to the field and why I identify with interaction design, I suppose. And created a good foundation and, and what that was all about. Product management was a move I made to have more of a seat at the table and stop having to just carry that torch into the dark corners and work from a position of responsibility without authority, which I think is one of the key conflicts we get into as UX professionals, especially in-house. So product management's been, been good to me. I, I think it's a really important place for us to practice product definition from a user-centered perspective. I think I might have said this to you before, but I used to, I did a little stint as a product manager, and one of the things I said about it was, it's like being a UX designer, except people have to listen to you. Yes, exactly, exactly. You're defining the product, you're making decisions about what to do, but instead of having to um, do it, and I'm gonna go, um, do it in such a way that uh, you're doing it by influence 
you actually get to do it with, with, with position. There are, people expect you to make that decision. There are some strange things happening to product management in a, in a highly agile development environment where they think the product owner um, is, is in that position. And unfortunately, that's a far more tactical position than I think product management ought to be. But, but again, you need to practice in all those ways, right? UX can be very strategic and it can be very tactical depends on the size of the organization and the maturity of their practice and understanding of what goes into good product and service design. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things that often comes up for me is, you know, I, I've said this before on the show about having talked to someone who is by title a senior UX designer, but they've got maybe three years of experience they've never interviewed a customer um, I don't want to get into what is UX but in a lot of ways it's like how how can we best be contributing to making things better and I think part of it goes to what you just said about company size and company maturity or, or process maturity because you know, the bigger the company, the more likely it is that you're going to be asked as an individual contributor to specialize. And the smaller the company, the more hats you're going to wear. So if you come up in a company like Nike, that is a very large company. Oh, I really wish I had six gear sometimes. Um, then, you know, you might be a senior UX designer but all you do is, uh, you know, either design wireframes or, or pixel perfect interfaces, but you don't actually go out and talk to people because the company's like, no, 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 we got researchers to do that. You don't have to do that. And I really feel in a lot of ways, unless there's a good structure and again, process within the management system, that that's a, a lost opportunity for career growth for these people and also for a more robust understanding of what it is they're actually producing whether it's research or design i have so many thoughts on this i mean the field has grown around me and i always hark back to the prescience of kim goodwin's talk at interaction 08 um, a keynote talk she gave which was each one teach one and the core wonderful thing, one of the core wonderful things at Cooper was that it had an apprenticeship model. And, you know, the beginning designer dropped into a, became a, a third person on a two-person design team. And I won't get into pair design necessarily, but anyways. Um, and, and user experience design is a field that ought to have an apprenticeship model. You learn by doing. And you learn from people who are masters around you. The thing that's, you know, I think what's nice about a large field and a large company is that if you want to specialize in research you have that ability but fundamentally what we're doing is so deeply collaborative you cannot do it alone you cannot do it alone and so you, you just have to find ways to bounce ideas off others you know find that direction cross you know cross across any walls that might be between research and design it, it will make a better product and, and you a better person and practitioner. So yeah, I vehemently agree. It's um, really hard to be that UX team of one. Um, but there's a book on it if you're there. <laughs> That's right. It's, uh, who Leo is that? Bully? Leo Bully? Leo Bully. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, but the thing is you need a community. I mean, we're humans. We have to have community in all these ways. And, I mean, you're, I think you're a real community builder, and that's one of the things you see so clearly. It's, like, it's not about titles and walls. It's about coming together and sharing knowledge. And, and I have, I'm kind of burned out many years ago now <laughs> volunteering for the Interaction Design Association, but that's another group that you know is a global community trying to create spaces for us to do our thing. And by the way, there is so much open road in front of me, I just really have to get out right now.
Uh, it's totally fine. I'm sure the, the Range Rover that's behind me is appreciative that we sped up. <laughs> that was like, totally funny. Yeah, it's a great day. For Mighty it. Columbia. You mentioned getting your start really at Cooper, and I know when we were setting this up, we talked ever so briefly about personas. I know that, you know, that was about the time that things were getting started around that, right? Yeah, he had um, published Inmates Are Running the Asylum, which which talked about personas, and obviously about face was in the market, too. Um, but Cooper was growing so fast. Like, I was employee 35 or something in 99, and uh, by 2000, I think we were at 60, and it got up to, you know, 75 or something before the dot-com crash. So there was a real need to train up new designers and represent the the idea of personas in a repeatable fashion, like make it more of a science, um, even as, of course, it's an art. But that's what design's all about, science and art. Yeah, it was one of my, one of the real fun things I did was work with Lane Halley and, uh, oh, there's a huge thing in the road, um, <clears throat> and codify how to make personas. And, we wrote up the great eight of persona creation. Um, and I think it's kind of remarkable how you can take a set of research interviews and insights about the people who do or could use your technology solution, your, your situation, your service, whatever, your product or service, and, um, and then find the patterns in that. And, and identify the proto-personas, the kind of inherent patterns of goals and objectives and contexts that feed into these user models, these personas. And over and over again, I've just had so much fun taking that data set and, and doing personas and, and creating those models based on actual users, but without the idiosyncrasies of individual people and, and far more specific than a market segment. I mean. I just, I don't know. I mean, so many years on, personas are old hat. I think it's it's old news in some ways, and I don't think there's that much controversy about them. But it's kind of tragic how much we've fallen back into markets, at least in, in some of the contexts I've been working in, in healthcare. We've fallen back into market segments and really kind of meaningless demographic data to describe our users rather than going for true insights about about their goals and, and context of use. So yeah, personas personas are a very powerful tool and every time I don't use them and then I remember personas and I go back to personas, the, you know, the design problem unlocks. The the direction becomes clear. And then they become such a great tool for prioritization and feature um, definition as well. It, it, it's yeah, I can't say enough good things about them, really. Yeah, and I was fortunate enough to learn about them at the knees of the man who invented them, so that's pretty cool. When I was first introduced to them, I don't think that we were calling them personas. It was still just calling them user profiles, but I think, you know, it had a lot of what you just described inherent in their in their internal design. It seemed to quickly be adopted by groups in the company I was at at the time and other companies and it was entirely informed by market segment research, right? So, okay, well we've got this persona form basically, or format we'll fill in our market research data, oh look we've got, you know, 60% of what we need We'll go and we'll talk to the CEO's daughter to get that perspective and, or whatever, you know, it's like, I think what, what really is fundamental to the, the lack of, of design making as big as a, as big of an impact at this point as it could have is that it's hard and it takes time and you can't just make stuff up and hope for the best. But it's so much easier to make stuff up, you know, fill in a form with what you know about somebody and say, all right, well, this is close enough. We can make design decisions based off of this. Yeah, it's pretty tragic that the thing is that, I mean, I would contend it's not even that time consuming or expensive. I mean, depending on your 
domain that you're working in, uh, it can be difficult to recruit the right folks. But the crucial thing, the relationship that exists between market segments and personas is actually quite tight. And a company should have their market segmentation model done, right? And know to whom they're trying to sell their solution. And then, as researchers, we come in and we, you know, and the, the rule of thumb is for a consumer product, you need eight to 12 representative users in a segment that you're going after. Or for a very um, technical or enterprise type solution, you need four to six people in a given role. It doesn't take a lot of people or a lot of time to do the kind of interviews that then give you that insight at a deeper level into unmet needs and really groundbreaking opportunities for that product to excel and, and you know be adopted and drive loyalty and all that good stuff you want. So you know, so you might have a consumer product going after three market segments and you need what, you know, 18 to 24 people? It doesn't take a long time. You can do, you know, four interviews a day. In two weeks, you've got your data. In two weeks, you've got your persona analysis worked out on the whiteboard, and you're going over it with your client and or your stakeholders or whatever you got. And <laughs> then you've got, you've got data that lasts you years. I mean, a decade. You could, I mean, depending on your domain, I've been working in healthcare and medical for so long where things move quite slowly and people's goals and fundamental human behaviors and responses to health and wellness don't really change overnight. And you can have a persona set that feeds your product work for, for a decade, you know, four or five generations of your product as you evolve to meet those, you know, meet those opportunities. It's just... Yeah, so I kind of shake my head at this. It's expensive. Let's talk about the value of it rather than the expense. Well, not rather than, but alongside the expense. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I just, for a long time, I had a really negative view of personas because of how I saw it being applied in practice. Because it was, oh, let's have a two-hour meeting, and we'll come up with the personas that way, and we're done. There's a term for that, and it's provisional persona. And that very specifically was meant to call out, yeah, this is a this is a scratchy, whiteboarded, internal knowledge-based persona. And one of the things that we did to call, oh, I gotta make a left up here, oh, we're good. Um, one of the things we did to differentiate that persona from, from a proper data-driven persona was we never gave it a last name and we never gave it a real photorealistic image. So it would have like a really sketchy um, design and that would, and only a first name. And then that's what uh, helped us call that out. Like you can't base, you know, your whole business around this sketchy persona that's based on internal knowledge. Um, but yeah, it's better than nothing though, Matt. It's still better than nothing because you've turned the conversation from, you know, well, hopefully a little bit more, from opinions of the people in the room or the, you know, the hippo, highest influencing person in the room, whatever the hell that acronym stands for. And, uh, and you've got, um, you know, an external user-centered measure against which to define your product. So even that sketchy-ass bullshit persona is better than nothing, I would contend. All right. You sold me. Yay! Subscribe me to your newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> I better start up my new Oh, yeah, 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 me too. <laughs> I am a believer in, in the well-rounded uh, uh, designer, research and design. You know, and, and I wanted to say a little bit more, too. I mean, if, if you're, the audience here is, um, is people at the beginning of their careers or hiring managers and stuff like that, I think there's so much um, challenge getting, getting a, a good understanding of what all I'm going to get in front of this. It created this UX sundial model to define um, the fields of user experience design on a spectrum of soft skills, right? So the soft skills, I, I contend, are, are understanding, definition, and communication, right? You need to understand the people for whom you're designing, the context in which you're designing, your domain. Um, there's all these activities of understanding. And then, and then there's definition. So you need to come up with solutions to serve those needs. You need to 
do the make the new model, make the new product, and define. The, the, I mean, that's and that's kind of the heart of the. So, I mean, when you think about understanding some of the fields like human factors engineering or usability engineering, they're really their folk research, design research. Their focus is understanding, and then the classic design fields from industrial design and graphic design and information architecture, interaction design, they're defining those new things and those solutions. And then all your activities of communication, right? Whether that's verbal, visual, even like project management and product management, I think have a lot, a lot to do with communication. And so if you think about like all the fields on that spectrum, you can think about your own abilities and, and and uh, talents and expertise and think about building a team, right? What if you did have a good team where someone's really strong in understanding, another person's really strong in definition, another person's really strong in communication? That could be a you know supercharged three-person team for something, as long as you collaborate and now one person, you know, <laughs> the, the, well, I don't know. I think you need all, all three to be, to be a good practitioner, but it doesn't have to be all, um, all at the same level. No. And, you know, then it, it becomes a, an opportunity to cross, teach each other about, about your strengths, and you just become a better team, a better individual contributor. You know, and I know, I know, I know that building teams is very difficult. Mmm, I'm gonna get a tasty stretch of curves ahead. Find your apex. And also, note to self, put it in the proper gear. Man, this bike revs so high, I can do anything in any gear. <laughs> well, I'm up on the pegs. Oh my gosh, that day at the track, the next day I could barely walk up and down stairs. Because you're so much like off the seat, you're essentially standing on the pegs the whole time, shifting your weight from side to side. Oh, outrageous. I leaned more than I'd ever leaned before. I actually think you know, something I always have loved about the field of interaction design and, and these fields and what we do is that it's, it's a discipline that you have to take your ego out of it. You have to take your own personal viewpoints largely out of the picture, except insofar as you know, you're, you're in charge of the decisions, but you have to step in the shoes of your users. And it's not one of the fields of design that rewards a particularly, you know, egoic, idiosyncratic, stylish X, Y, Z, you know? Like, we're not designing furniture. There's no means of interaction design that I'm aware of. And, and that's a really beautiful thing about it, but it's also very hard because we get so much ego training in our lives. Research and, and getting into people's homes and lives and seeing what you're doing for them is Absolutely, absolutely important. Um, Got to share that and, and spread that around the team. And, and that's why persona models become a powerful tool when they're done right, because you get to share those insights of the research and the context and, and your, your, your visibility into the user's worlds with the rest of the team who don't, don't have that luxury, don't have that opportunity. So, what kind of stuff are you working on now? You said you have been doing a lot of healthcare, and I've been doing a lot of healthcare. Is there stuff that you can actually talk about that you've been working on? Yeah, I can talk in general terms. Um, I have been working on conversational services, systems that let customers speak with um, service agents, and in this case, clinical uh, representatives who can help them with their health issues. It's been, it's been interesting working on that in a very large organization that has thousands of agents on established platforms. Um, so enterprise level platforms for, for their call based activities and trying to work in appropriate, I work on the agent side and collaborate with folks who work on the, um, the customer experience side, although it's, <laughs> literally a dialogue between the customer and the agent, so we work very closely together. But um, 
Uh, I think it's it's an of the moment sort of area of design. Um, reading uh, um, conversational design by um, oh my God, I'm going to space her name. The, the wonderful lady who works um, so bad with names. Anyways, she came out and I saw her at a Kai Fu. When oh Mike Montero's firm, right? So. Oh Erica Hall. Thank you. Erica Hall's conversational design was a book that um, you know I read through with furiously nodding and made all my colleagues at the company buy. But unfortunately, we haven't really been able to create some of the experience parts of that that I think are really essential for building trust and uh, doing conversational design in a coherent way, which is to say creating uh, uh, some personality on the bot side of that, right? Some, some artificial intelligence and stuff like that into the experience on, on a routine sort of reply basis. This person is going 20 miles an hour in the 45 minutes. I'm still running my consultancy, so I'm open to new opportunities and would like to do something a little more strategic and interesting, to be honest. Oh, this is very tight. Left-hander. Is it all right? Yeah, whatever. Okay. I'll just go slow. Well, okay, I'm going to pull up actually into the cafe. Screw that. Screw that left hand up. The word strategic has come up a couple times in our discussion so far. I want to talk a little bit about that. My pinned tweet for the last N years has been, UX strategy is product management, and I intend to prove that in practice. I think a strategy means that you're looking at the big picture and not just working on what's right in front of your nose. You're setting direction rather than necessarily following a path laid out for you, even as obviously it's a, still a group endeavor. I mean, lots of people contribute to strategy. It's no one person's job. It could be a see something person's job, but I don't usually see that happening. <laughs> On that point of like, it's everybody's job to be strategic. Is it though? Well, I think it is a little bit. I think if you're if you're designing a mobile app, and you're like, well, I just you know make the form work well. If you don't have an understanding of how you're, what the inputs are to that, what the outputs are to that, and and why you're even doing it. I don't, I don't have any science to back this up, but I feel like that informs you better than if you're just drawing a really pixel perfect UI, you know? Yeah, and, and maybe it's it's uh, pedantic, but it's like not everyone is uh, creating the strategy, but everyone needs to be informed of the strategy, aware of the strategy. And so no matter how tactical the task in front of you, you can line it up with the, the greater strategy that's, that's you know, in, in view. I have a line about product management, which is that um, the job of product management is socialization and alignment. And I think um, every time I share that with somebody, they nod and agree. I mean, it's what, what it's about at its heart is still influence, right, rather than dictates. But by socializing your strategy, by socializing the problems you're solving, by socializing an understanding of the people for whom you're, you're designing, you create the alignment needed to move all in the right direction, you know? And we can't be everywhere all the time. You want that developer working on that form field to understand that this is a person, you know, the user is very um, interrupted and distracted if you can build in form field validation in place, you're going to save them from, you know, abandoning the form or getting it wrong and having a problem. So, like, up and down, yes, everyone needs to be strategic, even as I think it does work best when there's a small, informed group of people defining and setting the strategy. Yeah, I think that that strategy gets informed by what the people, quote unquote, are on the ground doing. Obviously, it gets informed by the research. It gets informed by, you know, what is the business trying to accomplish? But, you know, to your point around, you said socialization and 
alignment. And again, you know, we might be getting into ped pedantry here, but yeah, let's go for it. We're back to the start of the show, people. We're going to start defining what what is UX. No, no, deny. You know, that's kind of my job as whether I'm doing service design or UX design is socializing and aligning the research, uh, the design choices, so that when it comes time for the, the final readout or uh, you're getting close to launching or something, what you're doing is you're reducing the risk that you have a swoop and poop moment where someone comes in and says, well, this is all great, but I really like blue. And then you're like, uh oh, that's back to the starting board or drawing board. And I kind of feel like, you know, I totally agree with you, obviously, but, and this goes back to the whole, everybody's sort of responsible in some respect for the strategy, either being informed by it or contributing to creating it, is everybody, is responsible for justifying is not the right word but informing people about their role and about their contributions and and why their decisions got to the point that they got to that it isn't just you know here's the interface or here's the requirements go um, everybody's brought along and again i feel like it's one of those things that's seen as well, that's just going to take a lot of time, that's a lot of meetings, that's a lot of blah, blah, blah. I found that overall, you have less redo. You have Absolutely. fewer iterations or fewer unimportant iterations. Yeah, 11th hour changes of, of um, direction that are so costly. Absolutely. I mean, so much of what we do in our profession is actually around that communication piece and that collaboration piece. And whether you're a consultant or you're in-house, that effort to get everyone's skin in the game and voices heard at the right points, and then you know guide the research, and then guide that that um, you know that checkpoints where everyone comes back together to absorb the research um, findings, bring people in at the right moments to to have them stay aligned through the process. It can take a delicate touch. It can it can be very difficult if you have someone who really wants to put their stamp on it or or you have you know turf wars inside your organization and you need to serve multiple masters and I mean it's it's endlessly difficult and and varied how that whole thing plays out. So you know good listening, empathy, compassion, um, leadership, articulation of direction in a way that's you know accepted and not seen as um, inappropriate or it's it's really something that we're always growing in um, across our across our um, years in the field <laughs> here hiring managers say things like hey what's your favorite design tool Duh. <laughs> my voice and my brain <laughs> the focus on a lot of design education Maybe not so much the formal education, but the informal education of, you know, if you just learn Sketch, if you just learn Figma, and you use this framework, that's all you need to know, right? Oh, it's, it's very small-minded. Do you know, it reminds me, I often talk about it because it was so huge for me. So I did three years at Cooper. And <laughs> I was a senior designer within a year. It was a, it was a booming consultancy, and we would ride in with so much power, you know, as a consultancy like that into an organization. And we would um, have our defined. I mean, our engagement managers were awesome, so we'd have an awesome project plan, and we'd execute on research and design and detailed design, and and deliver these awesome solutions. And then um, my next role was in house at St. Jude Medical. And I was part of a, a team, and I was the first person of my kind to be an in-house employee there. And I was working on cardiac rhythm management devices, um, so pacemakers and defibrillators. And I ended up designing the operating system that the programmer machine, this lap, custom laptop-based system, which programs and interrogates and programs and manages those devices across the lifespan that they're implanted. I had to work with clinical engineers and software engineers and marketers and and regulatory folks. It was extraordinarily cross-disciplinary, right? I didn't know how to program, you know, arrhythmias. What I did was half 
have to operate in that environment and get get my user-centered insights to be absorbed. Well, <laughs> you know, the consulting skills weren't necessarily preparing me for that cross level of, of you know internal collaboration. And God bless my my awesome manager found a class at UCLA called Persuasion Skills for the Technical Professional. And this class was so, so valuable to me and, and really woke me up to, to an area that, that can make me a lot more effective. And it, it ended up, I mean, in particular, that class, it was basically consultative sales. And consultative sales says, in order to have someone accept what you're selling, right, to be persuaded, they have to feel they need it, which sounds really airheaded, you know, but it actually is kind of insightful. You can't sell something on the merits. You have to have a dialogue with someone and find out what their needs are and then line up the thing you're selling to show how it serves their needs, you know? So, oh my God, I mean, right there, right? Like a practice of, of listening, I need to get in the right lane, um, listening and understanding and uh, dialogue is essential. To, to this practice. You can't just march in and, and do your own thing and expect it's going to work out well. Good stuff. Yeah, always something to work on. Beginner mind. What can I learn here? What don't I know? What can this person teach me? Really, really significant to good outcomes. Like I've never leaned before, Matt. I was like, I seriously had a breakthrough. Beginner mind, baby. Yeah, I'm currently slowly integrating trail braking. It's very hard for me to throttle and hold the throttle where it needs to be and adjust it, but at the same time be reaching out and braking. Yes, it's, it's exercise for the hand. So what kind of strategy stuff would you want to be doing? I had a pretty sweet role a couple years ago. I had an opportunity to work as a head of product for a startup in Australia. And so it's a Qantas company. Under the Qantas umbrella, they decided to launch an insurance business. And one of the key differentiators for the health insurance product was a wellness program incentivized with Qantas points. And it's such a genius thing because in, in healthcare and wellness, what we're always trying to do is get behavior change. And humans don't change their behavior without some real burrs under their skin or some, you know, shiny object in front of them, right? So either extrinsic or intrinsic motivation. So this, this amazing uh, opportunity, I was head of product and I got to manage a team of user experience designers, product managers, and visual designers creating the um, next feature sets and, and setting the strategy and defining the digital roadmap for, for this, uh, this company. And I got a lot, a lot out of that sort of role and the combination of, of managing people and mentoring and, and uh, growing their skills, you know, everybody's skills in each of the areas, you know, really coming together as a team. And, and we would work basically on our two platforms, uh, a product manager, a user experience designer, and a visual designer were this triumvirate. So, so growing, uh, adding new practices, I defined an entire double diamond agile development methodology based around design thinking approaches, you know, the, the opening and the closing, the investigation and the definition, got to really improve the product itself that it was, that was some good stuff so I really would love to do more at that sort of executive level um, in a healthcare or medical device type setting and I like process as much as I like detailed designs yes it's I mean it's so funny to me these design firms that want to say process is like a four-letter word you know and and creativity should be chaos and it's such a load of crap if you don't have a good process and underlying sense that there is some stability, you 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 know, we're you're gonna have to put all your energy into that. So so having a really solid process foundation I think enables creativity within the areas where it's needed, right? You know, what are the creative ways to um, deliver a solution to this need? Not how do I get my shit done and who do I talk to when? And, um, yeah, so so yeah, that that would be uh, my dream job.
that? Was was Qantas pretty open to that? Absolutely. That's the thing that was, I think, so great was, I don't know, I stepped in and they had a very reactive um, process such as it was. And they were three months post-market launch. So I was the first permanent head of product in the role. And the organization was really eager for design thinking and research and getting that voice of the customer. We had a ceremony called Walk the Walls. So it was a deeply agile group and all the executives, we'd come together and everybody in the company was invited to walk the walls. And the walls were covered with all the artifacts of research. Um, Whether it was marketing research from the very sophisticated uh, email um, and browsing sort of insights that Qantas had as a company of, you know, because half of Half of Australians are Qantas frequent flyers. We had tremendous insight into the whole, you know, landscape of of our of our users, and then um, the artifacts from interviews and usability testing and um, uh, browsing behaviors on our website and app activities and you know what people are clicking and where they're going. So walk the walls, uh, and we would, you know, the the president would be there and would hear some insight and green light a new initiative or have an insight about our customers that would lead to a better decision at the roadmap meeting the next day. Indeed, I was invited and and was part of some uh, groups to define product management, which wasn't a a particularly mature discipline there. They had product owners because of Agile, but no real sense of what product management meant across the entire life cycle from inception to market release. Yeah, it was it was rad. So there was a lot of uh, socialization and alignment, and not every team has that advantage. Like you know, we're really moving to more and more distributed teams. So it'd be interesting to see what sort of digital companion there is to the physical wall for that. Yeah, we have to share. We have to expose. And I actually had to had to let a couple people go under me in that role. I mean, being a manager is not all fun and games. And one of the people who, who had to go was someone who got very, a designer, who got very huffy when anyone asked questions about her materials on the wall, including the boss man himself who would ask questions and she would get super defensive and, and not have the right attitude of um, collaboration and, and open listening to what was being asked. The fact that the head of the company is asking questions about your research or your design ought to be an opportunity for celebration, right? How often do we get that line of communication? It's it's tremendously valuable. So we have to drop our defenses. We have to drop our reactiveness in some of those scenarios. And, and again, it comes back to beginner mind, lack of ego, a sense that you are always learning. You are always a disciple of, of new information. And, and you need to constantly integrate it, not not push back, not reject, not defend. You know the old the old viewpoint, which may may just been refuted if you can open your eyes. So yeah, it's it's not easy. But so we would have uh, so many great things I got to do there. Um, we would have a uh, like a town hall demo day every month. I can't remember how often it was now, but. Um, I, start, I instituted at the end of it the, um, the one-minute pitch. Anybody in the company could come up and do a one-minute pitch for a feature or even product or benefit or value prop of any, you know, whatever they wanted. And it was so cool. We had um, really interesting ideas come at us from the finance department, the people who watch the, the Qantas points accumulate and go by, creative concepts that led to changes in contact center processes and um, features added to our roadmap and, and everyone felt like they had a voice and as such they you know were even more invested in what we did do <laughs> so it was rad yeah so where i would want to be strategic the the short answer is I really want to help companies either figure out or understand better the why and the what. You know, why are you in business? What are you trying to accomplish? If we talk about how at all, it's only 
as a, a scaffolding for, for talking to the what and the why. Software company comes and they're like, uh, this is what we're doing. I'm like, well, you know, maybe you should be a t-shirt business. That's a ridiculous pivot, of course, but I'm really interested in working with companies that are open to either having that conversation for the purposes of generating what they should be doing and why they should be doing it, or or at the very least, we validate that what they're doing, yeah, they're actually on the right track. And it's, and it's about more than just whatever the current revenue is. What keeps a lot of people from uh, engaging with us at that level is they're like, well, you know, we're making money. We're in the black. Um, I guess I should be going faster. We're in the black and, you know, everything's great. We're, we're growing as a company and, and maybe it is great, but if it isn't continuously assessed, if you don't, you know, stop and say, are, are we still sure that this is the right thing to be doing and, and are, is our motivation still accurate? And the motivation can still be we want to do an exit, we want to sell to X, Y, and Z companies or whatever. I mean, that's fine. I, I'd rather see companies building up sustainable products and services that are basically built to last as long as they can, at least. We want to do meaningful work, get our mastery, get our autonomy, and get our meaning from our work. It's, uh, it's all better that way. Delivering products that make lives better. We have so many problems on our planet right now. We really have, have uh, no end of ways to help, I think, in, in what we do and, and, and in how we approach it, too, right? And, and bring the compassionate why. <laughs> it may be hard to hear and answer that why question, but when, when you ask it compassionately with this intent to, to improve, I think it, it serves everybody really well. So, Elizabeth? Yes, Matt. <laughs> was that uh, was that all right to do an interview like that? That was all right. Um, I was just, I was concerned ahead of time about the um, airplanes. I was concerned about the airplanes. You know, <laughs> the um, the divided attention, right? Um, so much of um, high performance driving and riding the motorcycle is concentration and just being completely present. It's meditative for me in that way. But uh, uh, you made it easy to chat, and I guess <laughs> I guess I have a certain amount of just intrinsic stuff I can talk about without having to um, overthink it. Well, it was area. it was good stuff to talk about and, and stuff that I think needs more discussion, always more discussion, and then action, of course. Yeah, but openness but, to yeah. to investigating and looking and improving. Uh, is seems to be one of the themes today. So, yeah, keep on, keep on fighting the good fight, people out there. There's nothing but good stuff to be done when you when you bring the right intentions and bring people together, get them aligned around the problem you socialize solving. Like airplane noise. Airplane noise. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank for you. My chatting pleasure. with me and doing it in a fun way. You're right. And I look forward to reviewing the footage and realizing that like one of the cameras was off the whole time. <laughs> That's Technical the fun difficulties. Part of, of going out in the field, right? Yeah. Trying new so, things. You'll make right. mistakes and learn from it. You will. So it goes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Always. And, uh, <laughs> you never know how to end these things. So all right. Let's just end them. Bye. Ciao. All right, good show, people. Good show.